back in the saddle again. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, Old Timers Day. You know, I must tell you, having looked at that uh, movie that was shown, I was very disappointed. Mark Rosenberg had assured me that he was getting George Clooney to play Robert Narons in that movie. Either Clooney didn't want the role, or maybe he was too busy, or maybe he just didn't look Jewish enough, I don't know. Sad disappointment. But despite this shortcoming, I would like to thank Mark for the opportunity to introduce this year's recipient of this eponymous award. Actually, Mark was the eighth recipient in 2013. For the less literate of you out there, the word eponymous has nothing to do with an enormous two-ton herbivorous semi-aquatic mammal. It's used to denote something, uh, a name, for a particular person. There's no limit to what you learned this morning. And uh, by the way, I think I deserve some extra credit for stepping out from behind my curtain of restful retirement to introduce this year's awardee. I can assure you, nobody here has seen Homer Smith introducing the recipient of his award. <laughs> Anyway, I've got 10 minutes, well now, closer to nine minutes, to give you a former insider's view of the gestation and development of this award. This award is given, as uh, Mark said, for sustained excellence uh, in scholarly education and teaching. After I do that, uh, I'll introduce this year's recipient, Mitchell Rosner, I decided to read this introduction, by the way. If, if I ad lib it, we'll all be here on Wednesday, and it, it just won't work. When I was a medical student back in the Eisenhower administration, this was in the early 1960s, those students who were good with their hands went into the surgical disciplines, and those of us who used our brains became internists. And the best and the brightest internists course, went on to become nephrologists. The lure of nephrology for me, and I suspect for most of you, was the discipline's inextricable, inextricable uh, marriage with science. The 1960s ushered in the beginnings of an explosive unmasking of the mysteries of renal function. The traffic and transport of ions and water in renal tubules and the ways in which fluid and electrolytes were conserved and distributed throughout the body were waiting to be translated into clinical use. Dialysis and renal transplantation were beginning to extend the lives of end-stage kidney disease patients and new and complex immunologic and pharmacologic findings were amassing in the literature. These research findings were not just interesting in vivo observations in rodents, nor were they just interesting in vitro findings in marinades of cells and tissues. These data would actually translate into clinically relevant diagnostic and therapeutic applications. Patient care would be improved by arming clinicians with these new scientific weapons. Initially, the incorporation of these studies in the training of medical students, house staff, fellows, was inhomogeneously uh, distributed across the United States. The major nephrology training centers were focused primarily on their research programs. Few, if any, had faculty dedicated primarily to education. A great scientist is not necessarily a great teacher. There is, after all, a talent effectively organizing, simplifying, and presenting complex concepts in novel and exciting ways. The early enticement to become a nephrologist 
is often sparked by the clarity of presentations of what the discipline had to offer. Back in the day, many of us had the experience of walking to the podium to begin a class in physiology or pathophysiology and looked up to see a hundred or more terrified faces waiting the complex kidney stuff that they knew they would never understand. The topic had been previously poisoned by institutional memory or poor communication. But when you really communicate to these kids, they begin to process the information. Puddles of axillary sweat begin to dry up, ears perk, eyes widen, and blood returns to previously ashen faces. You may even see light bulbs begin to glitter above their heads. When you can really do it right, the results can be magic. Over the past several decades, talented educators have emerged and found their place in more receptive academic centers. Indeed, the clinical scholar educator has proven to be a necessary partner in translating the findings of laboratory studies and clinical trials into practical applications for patient care. They complete the circle of bench to bedside nephrology. In 1995, I accepted the job as the ASN's director of postgraduate education. My narrow mandate at that time was to establish a week-long board review course and to chair the postgraduate education committee. Initially, this was a part-time job with a laughable salary, but I saw it as a serious opportunity to expand the society's role in education. Expansion of scientifically-based clinical sessions during Renal Week was an obvious target. The ASN's annual meeting from its inception in 1966 was and remains to this day a premier and prestigious scientific event. But early on, only nanomolar portions of the animal, uh, annual program were devoted to clinical nephrology. This initially small get-together, then largely for basic and clinical scientists, mushroomed into a very large meeting beginning in the 1970s. That was when the membership expanded exponentially. The burgeoning field of clinical nephrology accounted for this expansion, and Renal Week's clinical offerings did not keep pace with the increasing numbers of clinical nephrologists. There was an unmet hunger for scientifically-based clinical programs, and that was the opportunity that attracted me. The content of this 2019 meeting clearly demonstrates the Society's sustained commitment to balancing science and clinical education. I think our efforts over the last decade or so have worked out pretty damn well. This eponymous award was created as a tribute to those who have made novel, substantive, and praiseworthy contributions to teaching and education over the course of their lengthy careers. Recipients have been recognized for their local, regional, and national excellence as communicators, as well as for their creative contributions to the written and electronic media. Clinical and basic scientists have also been recognized for their educational skills and achievements. Several previous recipients have received the award for work done in bringing new insights to the organization of training curricula and ways of continuing to attract trainees to this discipline. This year's awardee, Dr. Mitchell Rosner, has more than satisfied all these requirements. His extensive CV catalogs a dazzling career of dedication and talent as a clinical scholar in ed and educator in nephrology. As is the case with many previous recipients, Mitchell Rosner's career began as a basic scientist. 
After graduating from Harvard University in 1986, he spent his next two years as a Harvard medical student, and in 1988, he transferred to the National Institutes of Health to become a Howard Hughes Research Scholar. Three years later, he pursued his research interests at the Institute of Molecular Medicine at the Medical College of Georgia, where he worked with the late Howard Rasmussen. Rosner then finished his medical school requirements in Georgia, completed his medical training at the University of Virginia, and after his medical residency, he became chief resident and remained on for a renal fellowship and finally joined the faculty. The Rosners have apparently remained hostages of UVA ever since. These years of basic science training have doubtlessly fueled Mitchell Rosner's critical and creative approach to problems in clinical medicine, investigation, and teaching. A prolific writer and sought after lecturer, he's been involved in numerous clinical trials, has developed new and creative approaches to the diagnosis and therapy of a variety of fluid electrolyte and renal diseases. His published reviews and case reports have all been characterized by their clarity and devotion to the principles of physiology and pathophysiology. Working with and chairing various ASN committees and with other prestigious medical societies, he has made important contributions to the development of teaching curricula and approaches to attracting the best and the brightest to nephrology. Mitchell Rosner co-chaired the ASN's board review course for five years. He is co-chair of this 2019 Kidney Week meeting. He's been recognized annually for his outstanding teaching skills by students, house staff, and peers at the University of, of Virginia. Believe me when I tell you his CV goes on and on. To provide you with a more granular detail would no doubt thrill his mother, father, wife, and children, but my time is running out. In closing, I, I, I congratulate the University of Virginia for recognizing Mitchell Rosner's many, many talents, including his contributions as a clinical scholar and educator. In 2012, they wisely appointed him as the Henry B. Mulholland Professor Chairman of the Department of Medicine. I also applaud the ASN's Awards Committee for making this fine selection for 2019. Please join me in welcoming Mitchell Rosner as the 13th recipient of this anonymous award. Thank you. Thank you very much, it's quite an honor, and thank you to the awards committee for my selection. Uh, <clears throat> this honor is really made much more special by having Dr. Narens here. Uh, Dr. Narens' educational legacy has really been an inspiration for a generation of nephrology educators, and I wanna thank him personally, I think, for really serving as a role model for many of us. I'd also like to thank so many mentors who have been there for me over the year and always provided sage advice, guidance, and help when I needed it. I can't name all of them, but I want to single out some of them, including Mark Acusa, Clyde Bolton, Don Cohan, Mark Rosenberg, Mark Perizzolo, Claudio Ronco, and Tom DeBose, all of whom have really been outstanding leaders in nephrology and have always been there for me. Most of all, though, I really want to thank my family. I am so grateful for their love and support over the many years. My children, Max, Sam, and Anna, have probably developed a little bit of a love-hate relationship with the kidney over the years. And I want to thank them for their patience, their support, and understanding over the many years of my career. It really means everything to me, and I am so proud of all the things that they do. 
hopefully they, they see that the most rewarding careers are built on those that really have a dedication and a passion to help others. To my wife, Michelle, who sacrifices every day to allow me to live out my career goals, I am especially thankful for. She is always there with words of encouragement and wisdom, and I certainly would not be here without her support. She is really the best partner in life that I could ever hope for. <laughs> Lastly, I want to call out the unsung heroes of nephrology, my fellow educators and training program directors who really have devoted their careers, like I have, to serving the community and teaching others. Certainly, bringing forward the legacy and the understanding and the future of nephrology is a critical mission for all of us. Being an educator is certainly hard work, but it's critical if we are to meet the demands and goals of improving the lives of patients with kidney disease. My thanks to all of you who serve as educators every day and really, I think, push the field forward. So thank you very much for this honor. Now I also have the pleasure of introducing today's state-of-the-art lecture.